What's up, everyone? Welcome to the first edition of the Sunday League Screamers podcast. I'm your host of today's episode, Steve McCutcheon, with my two co-hosts, Vino Anazelli and Michael Nowen. Say hello, fellas. What's going on, Steve? Mike, going on? You're part of the world. Uh, I was just in Miami, so a lot of fun. Didn't run into Lionel Messi, Messi, Paul Pogba, Paul Diablo. They were all down there. I was talking to them on Instagram a little bit, but uh, excited to be back <laughs> in reality that is Washington, D.C., so... Yeah. Yeah. Well, they probably hang out in the VIP section. You might not be able to get cool <laughs> yeah, enough to get into those. I doubt it. No, uh, I don't think so, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, to all 10 people that probably listened to our very first episode here, uh, we're going to be a Premier League podcast. We, we're three Americans talking about the English Premier League. So obviously, there's little redundancy there. Uh, we're going to be covering anything European competition wise. So the Champions League, Europa Conference League, Europa League as well. Any major transfer news. So anything going on in the Premier League, but also if, you know, Messi, Ronaldo, someone like that gets transferred, we will be covering that as well. And just to cover it off, we are American, like I said, so United States men's national team just as a bias as well. Um, other than that, we will cover, obviously, major tournaments, World Cup, Euros, Copa America, and et cetera. Go AFCON too. Why not? Let's throw that one in there. Mm-hmm. But before we get started about the Barclays Premier League news, we do have some interesting FIFA rule proposals that came out recently over the last week and a half. And I'm just going to read them off for you guys, and then we'll talk about them. Sound good? Yeah, let's do it. Got it. Awesome. Well, they're currently being tested out in a a, uh, youth competition, and here they are. So the first one is two 30-minute halves. The clock stops when the ball goes out. Kick-ins are going to replace throw-ins. Unlimited substitutions. And number five, kind of like a hockey-style rule, where if you get a yellow card, you have a five-minute suspension. So first thing is, what do you guys think about these rules off the top of your head? And why do you think FIFA is actually or testing these out to potentially implement? Um, let's, let's start with number one and work our way down. So the two 30 minute halves, honestly, I see the reasoning and we were talking about this a little bit earlier when we were kind of working through the notes. And I believe Steve, it was you who was saying that when they actually look at the true game time, when people aren't flopping and moving around and, pulling Neymar's and every other play realistically it's around that 60 minute mark where so like there's actual play the ball is moving right in motion yeah pretty and, much it's similar to like when they they ran an NFL study and they they said the ball was in play for about 12 minutes out of 60 they'd said the same thing for the soccer games it was or sorry football whatever you want to call it I don't know we should establish that pretty early actually in this podcast <laughs> we're going with football. Um, we go football all right so football. We'll, we'll, we'll do football um yeah the ball is pretty much in play for about 60 minutes roughly out of the 90 so that's kind of like the idea behind that I think it's interesting. I I definitely see the reasoning behind it. And I like the way that they're trying to think of ways to speed up the gateway of play and things of that nature. However, there's a part of me that's slightly traditionalist. And I like to see that, you know, dark arts, Jose Mourinho type shithousery where a player comes in and they just go, Oh fuck my leg. And they fall over and they roll around. They're on the floor for 10 minutes and they get up and run away. Like, Like nothing ever happened. I think it's hysterical. It adds an element to the game that, Some might not like it. Some might enjoy it. It's a little theatrical and it's what makes soccer or football, sorry, football. Right. Um, And I, you know, part of me really enjoys that piece of it sometimes. Cause you know, especially when your team's winning. Yeah. You want them to take the ball into the corner. You want them to take that hack to the leg and roll around, kill the clock, kill the game. So I, Mm -hmm. that's my opinion on it, but yeah, no, I I, I agree with you, Mike. I understand the the reasoning behind it and I, I don't think it's, a terrible thought process, but I do think it's not correct for the game. I mean, if you're really worried about the times players are, are wasting time in the game and et cetera, I think the onus should really be on the referee to, to push the tempo of the game and, and deal out yellow cards for those types of incidents. I mean, you saw when diving became an issue, um, yellow cards were now being thrown out for simulation. I think it needs to be something along those lines because with that being said, I mean, I know, I know the guys are running or the women are running, you know, nine, 10 kilometers a game, whatever, whatever it may be, depending on the player. But uh, at the end of the day, a lot of times it's it's not necessarily an exhaustion thing. I get with extra time, that's a, a whole other story. But it, it doesn't seem to me that running this into 30-minute halves is going to eventually alleviate the problem, especially if that's the main reason that FIFA mm-hmm. is suggesting these rule changes. I think there has to be other solutions for that problem. That being said as well, and I, I want to call this out because I just thought about this. It's not like they don't give out cards for time wasting already. For instance, when a goalkeeper yeah. is standing on their line at then near the end of a game and they go over that like five to 10 second yeah. mark and they get the yellow card from half field or somebody isn't jogging off the field when they get substituted, they'll mm-hmm. get a yellow card. So it's not like it doesn't exist. 
It's more about the enforcement, to your point, of those rules yeah. that they have to be taken more seriously. And my probably yeah, – Of course, guys guys get knocks and they, and they go down, and it's like, okay, I, I get it. You want to stay down for 15, 30 seconds because that might have hurt like shit. You know, I, I, I totally understand that. But there has, there has to be more enforcement from the referee's perspective to say, look, let's go. Come on, stand up, throw the ball, and do this, do that. Like you remember, you remember that Reese Jane clips that went viral when um, the ball got thrown to him and it just like hit him in the chest and it fell. It's like, okay, are you, that that's time wasting. That's a card, and it wasn't wasn't given out there, and that's part of the issue. If you're gonna if you're gonna let players get away with things like that, then you also can't complain about the game needing to be shorter to help alleviate that concern when you're not doing anything to stop that initially. What if what if they just like substitutions and like other things like that and they just stopped it or do you just not at all completely against it i think i'm completely against it uh, i'm i'm if it ain't broke don't fix it i mean it, it works is it frustrating yes but does every single team have the potential to do it also yes it's not it's not exclusive to one club or another if you're in a winning position which you hope to be in then that's your benefit for being in a winning position that's mm-hmm. simple as that you can't just start leveling the playing field on every single category. It like and like Mike said, they're not they're not stopping the game for ten minutes at a time. So at the end of the day, I don't think shorting the game thirty minutes, thirty three percent less, is not going to do anything. If anything, it's it's a little. I don't that's know. what that's what extra time is for. Exactly. Right? In the sense, exactly it's built in right there. Yeah. Yeah, as long as it's done appropriately. Like if there's, mm-hmm. I don't know how many of these refs actually keep the exact amount of time with it, and then what they base it off of yeah. exactly, but. Yeah, if they're if they're ballpark close five six minutes and something like that, maybe just I, I don't I don't think it's a big deal. The only time I think it comes into play is when they actually are doing it in during stoppage time, mm-hmm. and they don't add enough afterwards uh, yeah. to it. Yeah, but other than that, plus five, and they're doing a minute and a half of time wasting. Throw another minute and a half on there. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. if you want to finish the game, then control the ball, move it, score another goal if that's what it takes. But time wasting is not not the answer, and I don't think the rule the halves are going to change it. Yeah. Gotcha. All right, so then rule number two, you have the clock stops when the ball goes out. I mean, that's kind of – we basically almost covered that, I feel like, in the first question. Yeah. It, it wouldn't make sense yeah. to do and everything. No. Uh, three, kick-ins replace throw-ins. Um, I've actually played in a men's league. I've mentioned this earlier to you guys. When we were off wow, the, you're uh, an athlete. Wow. Yeah, crazy, <laughs> bro. I got my – I got listen, I got my I got my over 30 league tomorrow. I'm 27. I play in a men's over 30 league because, I don't know, I'm just – fat and out of shape apparently is a, is a ball boy is that what it is i wish i wish yeah i'm actually in the youth club i'm not the ball yeah. boy for the team <laughs> mascot <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. but um i i have done this it was actually i was in an intramural league when i was back in college um we did like an indoor league so i was inside like a, an actual basketball court actually mm-hmm. and we didn't have space to really do the throw-in so we did kick-ins instead i wasn't really too big of a fan of it i thought it was a little weird but like because it it was much easier to play across from like almost any position on the field. If you have like, like imagine yep. you had David Beckham from like the 50 on yeah. that right side every single time. Or Tony Cruz or anybody who can play yeah. a long ball like that. Yeah. yeah so I wasn't yeah. really too big of, cause you're almost like defending a corner or like a free kick at almost any point in the field. So I wasn't really too big of a fan of it. I get, I, like, I understood why they did it in that league specifically, but I mean, you're talking about like these professionals who could put pinpoint crosses on there. I, I think I think it's an unfair. Fair. I think it's an unfair an advantage. It would backfire so quickly. Yeah, it's and yeah. not for that. Like, I mean, what do you do with the short ball then? Because then, are you how do you how do you justify just not putting a guy right on the line in front of him, and yeah. then you make it impossible for him to even make a short pass? You're going to implement a ten yard rule like a free kick, and then back to your point, you're you're pinging it's balls back in the box. Like, and then to that too, it almost makes it feel like it's more just like. It's not necessarily in my eyes, it probably would take away from the beautiful game itself of like, you know, like a tiki taka, for instance, yes. or something along those lines. You're not going to really see that anymore. You'll just see people going, all right, that classic Mourinho method of I'm going to put a Flaney up there. I'm just going to let the ball go out of yeah. bounds. I'm just going to shoot for that shot and hope someone knocks it down and puts it in. 2017 right? Man United, like the reference. Yeah. 18, whatever it was, but hey man, he was doing that in 2013 at Everton before yeah. that. <laughs> that was the real OG Fellaini right there. He was a little bit better with it in 2013, though. <laughs> <laughs> just so, I mean, what, what, what would be to stop a team from doing that? You're yeah. sure, you know, that would be just yeah. to watch at that point, yeah. yeah and unless the rule was like just keep the ball on the ground only, like ground passes, that's the only thing that could really stop that. But then defending that would just be impossible. Oh, well, defending would be easier, I think. Maybe that's what I'm saying. Like the throwing yeah. are fine, like there's, there's yeah, nothing to change about that. Uh, number four, uh, I'm kind of a fan of this one, actually. If, if if you picked any of the five, unlimited substitutions, mostly just for the quality of the play. Because when we saw 
the extra subs at, at the end, like there when COVID first hit and mm-hmm. they like restart mm-hmm. the leagues, you started to see granted, maybe just, it was people out of shape and stuff like that coming back yep. from recovery and everything, but you saw more goals from these super subs or just like the quality of the play increase. So I'm actually not too against this one. Cause I think this would lead to more goals, a little bit more excitement in, into the game and later in, into the later stages. I would say if you're going to do it, you are only allowed to do unlimited subs maybe at like a time cap, like nothing beyond the 70th minute or nothing beyond the 75th minute. So if you're going to make the move, you have to make the move, right? You can't just be time wasting going back to what we were talking about prior and just constantly adding, still taking people off, just disturbing the flow of the game make, to make sure that there is a flow. Or right? if it's going to happen, it happens at like a 10, 15 minute interval or something along those lines. And then you can make that substitution when that interval pops up. Yes, yeah, it's not a bad idea. Um, agreed. Every 15 minutes, you're allowed to do it. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Because what are you going to have managers making a, a change every two Seven minutes? Seven subs in six minutes. Like, yeah, exactly. I, I do agree. If, if any of these rule changes were going to make a little bit of sense, I think it would be this one. I personally am not in favor of it. I think if you're going to change the sub rule, I think you should go back to five, how they're doing it um, You know, during the summer yeah. tournaments and whatnot. I think if you implement a substitution rule with, with unlimited capacity, you kind of lose a bit of, of – the tactical edge managers mm-hmm. are known for. I mean, that that's one of the things I enjoy so much about the game is you you drill your players and then you put them out on the field and you talk to them at halftime and maybe you make a couple little tweaks. But ultimately, your game plan going into the game is going to be managed by your players. And once you introduce unlimited substitutions, all the managers do, it, it takes the onus off them because it goes, okay, if I get it wrong in the first 10 minutes, I'll just throw five different guys in there to play a different formation or something like that. So I, I don't I don't actually enjoy the concept of bringing in extensive amounts of players during the game. I think you, you go out there what you have, you have tired legs, of course, so you're allowed some yeah. for that or maybe injuries, but I think unlimited is just is not right for it. Yeah, and then to build off that, if because this kind of is in the same vein, they obviously, I think the Premier League and some other leagues have been toying with this. At least the MLS definitely has done this. But like concussion substitutions, injury substitutions, yes. that's all stuff that should be there. If it isn't already, they need mm-hmm. to add that. You know, if it's like actually like a serious Raul Jimenez injury where like it's like yes. this guy obviously is in serious, a serious issue, right? Like what happened last year. Let that team use a sub. Let them not get charged with that sub. Like, you know, something along I agree. Yes. Yeah, it's like where do you draw? I, I completely understand. It's just where do you draw the line in that sense? Like, my sprain my ankle like yeah the sh- the, it yeah. hurts but like like what kind of sprain ankle is it a high ankle sprain like, like <laughs> yeah, so that can get like it. really fishy with it like granted yes like tra- like traumatic head injury completely different story yeah but um i i just like it just because i like the idea of the effect like the better play later on in the games it gets it more exciting the mm-hmm. only thing i will say is like we did see um when the restart happened last year it definitely benefited larger clubs who had yeah. a better bench of course oh yeah absolutely yeah so that would be the that would be the major thing against it, I think. Yeah, the other, the other teams could wouldn't keep be able to keep up with yeah. them in the second half. Manchester City would field like three teams a game. <laughs> they, have, yeah, they have three teams. They have the yeah. It's, 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 yeah. Oh, I mean, overall, truthfully, I'm not in favor of a single one of the proposed rule changes. I I think they would do no benefit, no major benefit for the game to push it in the right direction. I think. I'd agree with that. Got you. Well, yeah, let's yeah. just cover the last one. Then when you got just curious at uh, what you think exactly, uh, the five minute suspension for the yellow card. This one I found weird though, just because if you're gonna impose a thirty minute half and thirty minute half, so you're talking about sixty minutes, and then you're telling me if I got a yellow card, I'm almost out for a tenth of the game. Yeah. Yes. That I was like, okay, that makes no sense. Like, if you're gonna do it proportionally to like how much like time is like on the clock and stuff like that, that one made no sense to me. It just in terms of the how much time. Um, Again, back to my men's league, that's actually a rule, though. We do have to sit out for like two to two or three minutes. I forget what it is. If mm-hmm. the opponents score, you actually get to come back on and stuff like that. So it's legitimately like a hockey rule. But <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't know I don't what they're thinking with that one. No, it's ridiculous. No, it's I, don't, ridiculous. I don't like it. I, tactical fouls are part of the game. I, I mean, yeah. it's the same way in baseball. You intentionally walk a hitter to get to the pitcher after him, you know, if you need it. Like, it's 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 there for a reason. I mean, the, the indoor soccer league here um, in San Diego or – where I'm located is um, the, the soccer's they're called actually. So word of God, Clever and Landon Donovan played for them for a little while, and they had this rule implemented actually as well. It was I don't know if they were using yellow cards or just they called it a penalty and they put them in the box, mm-hmm. and it maybe happened five times throughout the game, and almost every single time there was a goal scored immediately after. And I know it's a little different because you're talking about indoor soccer league, but I mean these are professional athletes 
one player down is so detrimental, even for two minutes when oh, the yeah. guy's being off the field. I, I mean, what yeah. happens if the goalie gets a yellow card? Are you going to play without a goalie for five minutes? <laughs> like, yeah. That's a good point. I don't know. <laughs> keeper's got to go sit out and John Terry gets back in that. Like, come on. Hell yeah, baby. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's not <laughs> hockey. Yeah, yeah I'm, no, I'm, opposed, I'm opposed to that rule. I think it's a silly rule. Yeah, I, I, I have it in place with five yellow cards, game suspension, 10 yellow cards, two games, et cetera. You know, it's, I think it's an excessive rule. What yeah, I'll say I, I is good try, FIFA. You did your best as always, but <laughs> never quite good enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so bring back the Super League, right? Is a better idea? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then exactly. we do have another rule change, actually. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware or not about in the Premier League with the accidental handballs. Um, mm. They no longer are going to call back goals that are accidental in the buildup of the play, but they will still call the ones that are – I think the right word exactly like if it's a goal scoring opportunity yeah, to strike or does it, you know, it immediately yeah, directly to, to the goal. Yeah. What are your guys' thoughts about that? Obviously, we've seen VAR and um some crazy decisions all year long in the prime. <laughs> to say, the, say least. the least. Yeah, really. But um, I, I think it's a good rule. It it because there was many occasions where like a like a literally the ball gets tapped off my side, but it, it taps my it hits my fingertip or whatever it is, and then it's called it's called back. And I, I think yeah. it's horrible. Um, I think it's the step in the right direction, but it's not the finished product of what they need to be doing with VAR, which is a whole nother conversation yeah. and a whole separate topic that we could dive into. We don't have time for that, but it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, I think it makes sense. I mean, it's an accidental handball in the buildup. Like the pro- my only problem with it is probably the wording of it is what's considered accidental. I mean, if a ball's in the mm-hmm. air and it's coming down, a player tries to take it off his chest and it hits his arm. Yeah, that's an accident. But I mean, if you're not getting if there's no players around you, that should be called. That's that shouldn't be considered an accidental handball. You you had an opportunity to bring it down properly because at the other end of the field, that's going to be be called. So, I think it's going to be interesting to see what they consider accidental and not. Um, but I definitely think in the build up play, it's it's important. Yeah, oh, it's man. all going to be basically how how it's written, how the refs interpret it, and then the consistency yes. of that all year long. And if it's just going to go back and forth, probably will just go back. Yeah, it's probably Wait, with, the, with the with the Premier League refs, man. Oh my god. <laughs> It's going to be ridiculous. They're going to abuse the shit out of that rule. Like they yeah. have all the other rules. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I, like, like Mike said, it's, it's a good, it's a good start, but we'll see if it actually works. Hey, we <laughs> had, we had, I had the same positivity about VAR coming in and that has I think been we all total, did. That was, that's been a total shit show. So yeah. that's how I'm now viewing this because of their incompetence. Or must have like a 20% success rate at this point. <laughs> I mean, technically, I guess it's always successful, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> it's open interpretation. Yeah, no, nah, it's yeah. – it hasn't lived up to the expectation. I think that everyone thought it should have – or yeah. that it should be working out. The, it's very inefficient still compared to what we think – or to what it should be at this point yes. in time, I think. I agree. Yeah, so that's pretty much wraps up all the news and notes from like uh, just around the world in general and stuff like that. I do want to get into the Premier League now because that's obviously what we're based off of. Mm-hmm. And just to kind of talk about a couple of the team's needs right now for the upcoming season. So I'm basically just going to start off alphabetical order for the most part, or just whatever the league is in general. Mm-hmm. So we're going to start at the top here. Uh, Vito, if you want to take it away here at Arsenal. And just for the listeners too, we're only doing the first 10 on this episode, correct? Yes, yeah, so we're that. just going to cover the first 10 and then the next, okay. the next uh, alphabetical episode, the other one. Just yep. so everybody's aware. Yeah, so we're going to go to, from Arsenal down to Leicester this, on this uh, episode, and the next one's going to be Liverpool down to Wolves. Yep. Okay. Yep. Works for me. Um, I mean, you can look at Arsenal and you can say basically everywhere from a, from a perspective. I mean, <laughs> Aubameyang floundered a little bit last season, but Kyle Saka was really their their strongest point. Um, you get a lot of you know fifty fifties on Burn Leno in, in net as well. He has he has made a couple of mistakes that have been costly, but I think if you're going to look at one position, Ar- Arsenal really need to strengthen. And truthfully, they've had to strengthen for the last several years, and it's it's still that center back position. I mean, mm-hmm. you brought in David Luiz, but it's, is he really <laughs> is really your top choice guy? I mean, you you swap Mustafi for Luiz. I'm not sure that's necessarily a a major trade up. They also bought we- two other center backs. Let's not forget William Salab. What I am totally going to fuck his name. Salaba. Salaba, who they yeah. then loan back to Frank, Real, yeah. To, yeah, who hasn't played a fucking minute for Arsenal. <laughs> yeah. Then Gabriel, who I'm from what I've read hasn't lived up to the expectations of Arsenal fans. Yeah, thus far. Yeah, I I think they really need to make sure they're they're short up in their defense. I mean, they're 
they weren't leaking in goals last season for the most part. I think they only let in, I think it was 39 goals against was their total. So it wasn't terrible. It was actually almost the lowest of the top like 10 teams in the division, but that's still an issue. And, and with the speculation around Bellerine leaving, um, it's going to be more important than ever to have, you know, a, a center back there and now a right back. One, one thing that is going to be curious to see for them moving forward in, in the transfer market is what's going to happen with Danny Ceballos. He, he hasn't, he's, he's all alone. So he's going back to Real Madrid and he's going to fight for his place in Madrid, whether or not he's going to get it, who knows, but if he leaves, that's going to leave a, a decent hole in that midfield for Arsenal that they don't really have excessive personnel to fill at the moment. So I, I think their spine is um, through the, you know, midfield and defense spine that is, and mm-hmm. potentially goalkeeper is where they really need to be looking at. I got you. Yeah. I, I don't think they have anything in the middle of the field. Um, ironically, I think David Luiz losing him is actually addition by subtraction in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he was really that great. Yeah. But yeah, no, I think defensively they were, they're really, really poor. I mean, the, the numbers up don't say the, the right number, like don't say the story for that, but just watching them and just having the eye test on that, they really just were like dysfunctional in my opinion. Um, and then the midfield, they just have no attacking prowess. In my, like, I, I just, there's nothing there besides on the outside. And Aubameyang had like a pretty eh season up front too. Mm-hmm. Do you guys think, just being honest, like I got completely non-biased like answer here. Do you think they're still a top six team? Because I personally don't. No, absolutely not. At the moment, no. no. Got reaction, no. Yeah, I, I think their recruiting is going to be the toughest thing to get back there because they haven't been in the Champions League I want to say since 14, 15, yeah. 14. Well, if you, if you notice too, and they, uh, they, you know, they've been doing a pretty good job and I'll give them credit for this. The few things I'll give them credit for right now, at least they're bringing it through youth like Saka, like Emil Smith Rowe. Mm-hmm. I think uh, Martinelli, right. Who's mm-hmm. a really good player from Brazil who's coming through. So it's not like they don't have pieces to build around. It's more about how can Arteta get the most out of those pieces. Yeah. So, and who, who knows if, <laughs> I mean, God willing, maybe we'll see on this new Amazon documentary that they have coming out. Uh, oh, they're, they're going down the same route as Spurs, and yep. hopefully it's as much as a shit show because it would be awesome to watch in the internal <laughs> work of that club. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can look at the table right now and you could pick eight, nine teams that you could say can go either way, above or below mm-hmm. Arsenal. Mm-hmm. Here, I mean, between Wolves, Everton, Leeds, Tottenham, West Ham, and Leicester – Mm-hmm. Arsenal could easily be on the top of that list or at the bottom of that list this year. I think Mike's right. It's about what Arteta is going to be able to pull out of them. Yep. Yeah. I just don't think they can recruit as best as they, they used to be able to. Like, they're not going to be pulling from teams uh, in the top leagues. Like, I think they what they're doing with Ben White right now and they're getting that transfer coming uh, coming through in the coming days. Yeah. I think yeah. that's what the, I think that's going to have to be their new strategy for the next year, year or two. Just take some of the poach some of the best players from the lower teams in your league, maybe some other yep. ones as well. Yeah. Because Bayern. they're not playing European football right now. So, they just kind of built, built from, up in uh, Belgium too, like like a small younger midfielder supposed to be mm-hmm, really yeah. supposed to be really talented from like Anderlecht or something like that. But that's that's yeah. gonna be their strategy, like that 15, 20 million transfer of like a kid who's like twenty years old, maybe yeah. has like that like unpolished but raw talent. Yeah, absolutely. It's gonna be that in the youth academy right now for them. They don't have really another option because they can't spend big because they're not getting that European funds. Yep. So next on the list we got Ashton Villa. For the most part, uh, I think it's going to rely heavily on Grealish uh, if he stays in or if he goes. It seems Obviously. to be like he is – they're willing to punch out or push out some really good money for him right now. So if that happens and he stays, I think they can be a really quality team. In the beginning of last year, they were punching well above their weight like from what we all probably thought about, and they were in the top half of the table for a very long, very long time. Um, when he got hurt, though, you saw the dramatic difference in their mm-hmm. – just going forward, just going forward in general. I think they're going to need a backup striker behind uh, Watkins just to push him for a little bit of competition and just to have in case Scott forbid an injury because I don't think they have anyone really behind him that's uh, stable. Mm-hmm. Defensively, I think they're actually pretty solid. I think they could use another left back and then maybe a little bit of midfield depth just to kind of shore it up a little bit, uh, just to push push the starters, get a little bit of competition going in there. But overall, I think they're actually a pretty solid team. I think the Martinez transfer from, I don't know if it was two years ago or just last year, uh, picking him up a goalkeeper, I think that was pretty huge. Yeah, he's been uh, on a side note about Emiliano Martinez. I mean, that dude has like, I don't know if you anyone who's listening has heard his story or know or know what he's been through with like the loan system coming to Arsenal, and then he was loaned out for like ten years. Finally, gets the breakthrough after Leno gets hurt, goes to Villa, 
that crushes him in the Copa America this year to get Messi his first, you know, international trophy. That uh-huh. dude, that dude is on a he's playing out of his mind right yeah. now. That was a hell of a pickup and a hell of a signing for them. Yeah. Yeah, and they just picked up Ashley Young again. He was, if for those who don't know, he was actually at the club mm-hmm. as a left winger pretty much. Uh, wow, probably like 10 years ago or so. Now he's yeah. actually playing fullback. But yeah. just things like that, I think they're doing a very good job of. Like I said, I think with, you know, McGinn, I thought when Ross Barkley first got there on loan last year before he got hurt because he played pretty well right before mm-hmm. then he got injured and then his, his spell was okay afterwards. But someone like that just to kind of push the pace for them and get forward, I think is going to be huge. Yep. Um, especially when if, if Grealish is out, I mean, I, he, he he's their talisman. If he leaves yeah. like, I don't know where they go. Defensively, they're not bad at the back. Like they're they're pretty solid. I wouldn't say they'd get relegated, but they're they go from a top half team to to, to like 15th, 14th. Probably. Yeah. Their whole offense lives and dies through Oli Watkins and um Grealish. And when one of them isn't there, you can see the drop off. I I'd be curious to see if they come in for Tammy. I mean, he was on their loan for I think it was two years or so. And if the asking price of 40 million, like you said, Steve, they need a striker or someone behind them to get goals if that's not working out. And I'd be curious to see if they come in through him. Or, yeah, they, they poached um Buendia, uh, I think that's how you say his name, from yeah. uh, Norwich City. Yep. Yeah, they, they spent like, close to, I think, 40 mil or something yeah. on him for that. He's, he's a good attacking. Uh, that might be in preparation for Grealish leaving. Yeah, it might be. And if it's yeah. not even better, like have both of them, one on the left, one on yeah. the right, one on the mid, whatever you want to do with them. So he 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 could be another talisman for him as well. But mm-hmm. as of right now, the team stands, I think they're actually in really good shape. I don't think they're in any kind of relegation troubles in the least bit. I think they're probably a top half team again. I would assume so. Do you think their transfer strategy is going to be impacted mostly on injuries? Maybe like they're a January transfer window team. Yeah, probably. I could, yeah, I could see that easily. Yeah. But uh, yeah, let's go uh, go into the next squad there, Michael. Yeah. Next up in alphabetical order, we have Brentford, the newly promoted, most likely to be relegated team <laughs> to come come up. Um, no, I, I honestly super stoked for them to be in the league. They totally deserve it. For those who didn't watch their championship run, they had a hell of a run to get into just being here. Their story, speaking of team stories, super cool. If you're familiar with Moneyball, they pretty much moneyballed soccer and came up through the ranks of the English pyramids league pyramids of themselves to find themselves where they are now. Unbelievable proven goal scorer and Ivan Tony. Excited to see what he does in the Premier League. He was on the shopping list for a lot of big clubs, but he recently denied them. How many did he uh, drop because... last year? It was, it was thirty something, right? It, it was it was up there, man. He was, he. I think he set the record in the Championship, if I'm not mistaken, for the most goals and most assists. Yeah, he, he did have a lot of assists as well. He I think I, I'm not exactly. He might have had close to forty plus combined. He, he was positive. he was absolutely phenomenal. Um, he was unbelievable. But realistically, what it comes down to for some of the, some of the research we've done, <clears throat> they really need a goalie. They really need to build themselves up defensively. Um, it'll be curious to see what they do. I saw and I was reading online that they signed um, somebody from Celtic recent, I think like today or like last week um, as a defender, central defender. Um, so we'll see what they do. It seems like they're aware. I personally think that they're most likely going to get relegated. I don't see them staying up. Would love to obviously see them punch above their weight, but given the talent, um, some of the other teams, we'll see. I mean, we'll, maybe they money ball the shit out of it. Who knows? Maybe they Billy Bean <laughs> it. I don't know, but um, you know, time will tell. Yeah, I think with a lot of these promoted teams, you you get one or the other. Either you get them coming out swinging, and you're like, whoa, they're performing way higher than you expect them to, or to your point, they just they're just like, okay, we won. Well. Not not for nothing, but Sheffield United this year, <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah, it was a rough go about after their first season too. Yeah. That was a depressing one to see because they had such a good defensive. Uh, yeah, exactly. For the longest time. That mm-hmm. second season, that sophomore slump. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm. I'm I, my. Uh, we're gonna get to them a little later, but Leeds. I'm very curious to see how they they perform after such an impressive uh, first season back in a very long time. Yeah. But yeah, now Brentford, from what, what I saw too, they basically sound like a bunch of young guys for the most part. I've seen they they pulled from a different a couple of different youth academies and bringing those guys in. Yep. They're not afraid to give them a give them a start. So no. it, it's gonna be interesting. They're, they're gonna have a very young lineup, I think. And yeah. sometimes that's good, sometimes it's bad. It could go either way. You're fearless in the, or you're inexperienced. It's one in or the, the other. Cha- in the championship last year, they had the third best XG behind Norwich and Blackburn. So it's not like they don't create opportunities. From mm-hmm. What it seems yeah. like. Yeah, that's all. That's literally what they're all about, actually. It'll be fun so, to watch. Yeah, should be interesting. Uh, next up, we got Brighton. Uh, Vito, if you want to take yeah. it away for that one, uh, Brighton's a no-brainer. They need a they need a goal scorer. They 
they have found the net uh, 40 times last season, which while it wasn't the lowest in the league, it was definitely close to the bottom there. Was that the least amount of goals from a non-relegated team out of curiosity or no? No, Burnley only scored 33 last year. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they weren't quite the bottom and, and Wolves had 36, but after that, yes, they're the third lowest from a non-relegated team. And simply put, I mean, they finished second from bottom. Your, your defense can be strong and they, and they were strong defense. They historically have been ever since they came into the Premier League. I mean, we'll see how that might change if, if, um, if a couple of their defenders leave. Mike, and we mentioned it before when you were discussing, um, or we were discussing Arsenal, but mm-hmm. um, you just can't stay in the Premier League if, if you don't convert your opportunities. Uh, it, no matter what game you watch with Brighton, you can just see chances just screaming for yeah. finishing on the, on the other side of it. And um, I mean, looking at their squad, their third highest goal scorer was Lewis Dunk with five goals, a defender. I, <laughs> you, that just can't happen. You know, it's just, it's, it's not, it's not conducive to stay in the league. You can't, it's, it's not sustainable. Mm-hmm. Um, so if there's one spot Brighton need to look for, it's, it's someone else to put the ball in the back of the net because mm-hmm. uh, Malpe, I can't pronounce his name. Um, can't do it all himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd love to talk shit on them even more, but I mean, I think Zuma was Chelsea's highest goal scorer for a very long time last year off all the headers. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> I think he was leading at one point. <laughs> he 100% had to. And then another team floundering in front of that number one, you know, but so, yeah, that yeah, was... uh, I, I could put it the striker is their guaranteed thing. Defensively, they're strong for the most part. I don't see that breaking. Even, even when Ben White leaves, I think they'll still be okay. They might not yeah. be as good, but. They need someone up front that can just finish the chances. They create, which is the worst part. Their expected goals of a game is relatively pretty good for a bottom half team like they are. Mm-hmm. They just need to put them away. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I completely agree. I think their their margin last year, the goal differential was only like minus six, which, I mean, for a team to finish second from the bottom, uh, second outside of the relegation points from the bottom, to have a negative six goal differential is, is actually incredibly impressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, nah, you're you're probably if typically if you're looking at a team like that, you're you're, you're thinking they're negative 14, 15, 16. At least minimum, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think the next who's next to them? Yeah, negative twenty one Southampton, negative twenty two from Burnley, and the top and bottom around them. I mean, we'll say they they really need to sign a striker. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next up, we got Burnley. Um, very similar to Brighton, in my opinion. Uh, pretty relatively pretty strong defensively. They've been in the league for a little. Uh, They've been, I mean, they've been in the Premier League up and down a little bit, a few times and, and all, but defensively they're there, Pope and Net and all that. They just don't have anyone in the midfield to create for them. Not saying their strikers are great by any means. I know Vidra hasn't scored, or he scored very little compared to what he should have been in the past. And, uh, you know, Ashley Woods up there. All, they have people that can put the ball away, but they have nothing. I think they have a very big disconnect from their defense to their attack, and it relies on that attack and midfield presence. I think, I don't think they'd afford him or by any means, but... Someone like a Jesse Lingard, if he was to kind of go to a team like that, I think he would spark immediately of Ross Barkley. Someone like that might be a more affordable option for them, even just taking him on loan, something along those lines, because that, that's really what they're missing, I think, in that team for the most part. The bald ginger assassin, that manager, man, Sean Dyche. <laughs> God bless him. Uh, I mean, well, he's in love with Sean Dyche, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> he really is. He actually has a pretty hard man crush. Every on time him. This I, I do. Comes up. I, I do. He's, he's a phenomenal dude. He really is. And I, for him to consistently take that same molten boiling pot of shit that is Burnley and make it into a hard brick and mortar stew or whatever he does with them. And that, obviously, they can't do anything going forward, but defensively the foundation's there they just drop back play that 4-4-2 and have their big guys chris wood vitra just throw an elbow get nice and dirty with you like i honestly i respect it and they've been in the league they have held their own they're obviously going to finish you know like that 13th to 15th spot they'll be in the relegation battle for like a little bit but they'll they always pull through i respect the crap out of sean dice i'd be really curious eventually to see him leave that club and go to maybe like you know, an Everton or something like that, where like he could probably prove something with a lot more funds. Um, but that man is a man of loyalty. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> He's a man of loyalty. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's not much to say about Burnley. It really depends on if they're able to get that attacking midfielder. They're really able to get that other secondary striker. There's rumors floating around, speaking of Everton, that they're going to potentially come in for one of their wingers. I forget his name. I think it's like McNeil or something along those lines. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're saying he may or they may or may not come in, which would obviously be a huge blow for them. We'll see if they spend that cash wisely. 
Yeah. Yep. No, I completely agree. Next agree. up, we got Chelsea. I'd love to see the rumors with Holland. I don't like. I don't think that's. I, I don't think it's possible. I think a more realistic transfer might be someone like Lewandowski for them. Uh, as I know, he him his agent from uh, was talking has, about them leaving Bayern. Has, has that been confirmed? Like he actually wants to go as well. Will he come to the Premier League? It, uh, no, it's just, it's just a rumor, just throwing it out there and stuff like that. But I don't see Holland actually going. I, I think Dortmund's very firm on that stance unless you offer them some ignorant amount of money. And I mean, like, mm. 150, 175 million, which would be pointless. I, I don't think anyone's really worth that much. But uh, Lewandowski might be a better option. I, who knows? Lukaku's been thrown out there. Plenty of different people. Well, they said Lukaku wasn't going, but we'll see. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, if, if the latest reports are to believe um, that – Roman Abramovich, Chelsea's owner, signed off on the 130 or 140 or 50, whatever it is. I, do you think that Dorman could even turn that down? Because, I mean, no, not at all. That's what Chelsea yeah. need. And Holland, I think, according to reports, Holland would be okay with it. And I don't know. Oh, 130 million for, granted, it's Erling Holland, right? Yeah, but yeah. 130 million for Erling Holland, you take that, no questions asked, and you reinvest that. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it's Dortmund's MO, realistically. Yeah. It's build up young players, sell them for an like, absolute crap ton amount of money. Yeah. I, I think Chelsea need a center defensive midfielder, too, also. I think N'Golo Conte, I mean, was he was injured a little bit this season, and he's you know he's getting older. And while while it doesn't seem likely that N'Golo Conte will ever stop running, I mean, <laughs> he, has, he has to eventually, you know. And I think that's – well, they were looking at, who was it, Declan Rice recently, but 100 million pounds. Yeah, West, West Ham, yeah, they're not going to get that's, that's, yeah, you're, yeah. That's, that's pointless. Because, I, I mean, Jorginho obviously can't play that that role back there. And I know Conte's kind of turned into more of a box-to-box midfielder rather than a defensive midfielder. Um, but I think that's another area, area they need to be looking in. Yeah, I think that's the role Billy Gilmore is going to play out on loan for uh, Norwich City right now. I think it's a very good job by yeah. Chelsea. For both teams, I think it's very, very beneficial. And um, he's probably going to get that year right there. They're going to pull him back. and he's, he, I'm not saying he's going to be starting next year, but he's going to be a very big team like role player for them, if not, if not in the first 11 every day. Agreed. I think they would include Timo in like a swap deal in cash. I think Timo would do it. I think no. it'd be smart for Chelsea to do, but I don't think Dortmund would accept. I think they just want straight money at that point. Yeah. Which I mean, Chelsea, Chelsea's gonna have. Um, I know they spent a bunch last year, but they already sold two players so far, and they think they're sitting at plus six. And a bunch right of academy now. players also. I know for you know smaller fees, but pennies dollars, you know. Pounds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, d- don't forget they sold uh, Gu- I don't know how you say his name, Gu- Guhi. Uh, Goy, okay, whatever this the center back, he went to Crystal Palace. That was yeah. about twenty mil, and then they sold Tamari, Tamari for another Tamari thirty or something like that. So yeah, they're they're sitting close to about sixty million worth of transfer profit already. They're building up the funds, and then whatever you know, yeah. TV money, whatever else they have that they're allowed to spend. So they definitely yep. could afford it, I think. But the weekly wages would probably be astronomical. Well, I mean, so, the yeah. Champions League purse for winning alone yeah. is exactly. like ridiculous. So I mean, we'll see. Who knows? But. That's definitely where they're going to be looking. Yeah, it's it's yeah, striker and center back are their biggest needs, and then probably next year would be center defensive without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, next up, we got Crystal Palace. Yeah. So, tell me, I'm curious what you guys think about this, but I, I think Crystal Palace' biggest bit of transfer business that needs to be done, their biggest need is not necessarily bringing players in. Of course, they need to do that, but it's really convincing Zaha to, to stick with them. I mean, he's <laughs> he's obviously their best player by. Miles, not a, a light year, I guess. Let's go with. But, <laughs> like, That's probably the right measurement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I mean, we'll we'll see what happens with that. But I think he's. Correct me if I'm wrong, but he, I think he's coming into his last year of his contract right now. I feel like every. Uh, I, I'm year, not sure. Yeah. I feel like every year I've been following the Premier League since Zaha has been playing. It's always been Zaha wants. He's out. leaving Crystal Zaha Palace. Leaving yes, Crystal one thousand percent. Yeah, I just had this image <laughs> in my mind that they're just like holding him like in a closet against his will, like and he's like, <laughs> like just duct tape and they're yeah. like, "Hey, man, you're not going anywhere." Like, so it's not his last year of his contract. He signed a five year deal back in 2018, so he has two more years left. But if you're going to get max value from Wilfred wow. Zaha, it's you sell now. now. It's not next year wow. when he has one year left when everyone knows he wants to leave. And yeah. I, I mean, at his age too, he's how old is he? Pretty much in his prime. I think he's like twenty years old. I think he's like yeah. just in his prime. Well, they just signed. Well, they got Ezzy last year, who had a, a pretty solid first year. He was very good, re- really good for like a young yeah. player from QPR. Came up. He had a little problems with injuries. They signed another kid, I, I think, from the championship. I can't remember his name, but there's been very good reviews about him. Yeah, so uh, Michael. Have, Michael Olsey. I'll see. I don't know how to say his name. He came from Reading. They're gonna yeah. have two pretty good attacking midfield players to play in tandem with Zaha, right? 
Yeah. Um, I think what it comes down to is like, you know, they had, um, what the hell was his name? The, the coach. Uh, oh my God. I can't remember him. But anyway, they had whatever the hell his name was for a while. Um, and now they have the new head coach who's coming in. I can't remember who that is. It's not Lucian Favre, is it? It's a, uh, oh my God. It's the it Arsenal. Roy, you were thinking about Roy Hodgson. Roy Hodgson, but they brought in Patrick Vieira. Yeah, Patrick Vieira. So yeah. I would be, that's my biggest thing with them is what the hell is he going to do with that team? Because honestly, I'm not too familiar with Patrick Vieira as a coach. I don't know what his style is. I don't know what he typically does and how he interacts with the players. So I'm curious what he's able to get out of them, what kind of system he implements, because that was a very, you know, at the time, conservative Crystal Palace team. Is he going to go down those same routes? Is he going to expand yeah. and do something more attacking? Like, what does that really look like? And that's, yeah. I think, the biggest point for them. I agree. And I, I think um, with the departure of Loftus-Cheek on loan, I think the, the rumor right now is that they're looking to bring in Connor Gallagher on loan. For, and he's, they're, they're somewhat similar style of players. And I think that'd be smart for them. They're, they're a little light in the middle of the park. And I think Gallagher yeah. would bring up a bit of quality um, and composure on the ball because, I mean, that's exactly what he does. And he's he's done it very well, you know, proportionally to the, you know, the level that he's been playing at. Um, and I, I think that would be a really good pickup for them through the middle. I think yeah, they, they, need, they just they lost Towson too. Don't forget to Everton. Yeah. Yeah. The, so that, I mean, that, that's definitely a big, uh, a big replacement for them specifically. Yeah. And fun fact, actually, I don't know if you guys saw or not, they actually signed a, a United States kid to uh, I saw a that. Weird deal. Yeah. From yeah. Georgetown. I saw that. Yeah. yeah name's Jacob uh, uh, Montez. Yeah. Won a national championship with Georgetown back in 2019. He's played on various uh, USL teams and stuff like that and academy teams uh, in the United States. But they got him on a one-year deal. So who knows? Maybe you know, young 22-year-old might get some time there. You never know. That would be pretty sweet. On the watch. Another U.S. international in the Prem. Oh, yeah, baby. Next up, we got Everton. Actually, we just talked about them. They just brought in Andros Towson. Um, they bought Damari Gray and Asmir Begovic. Uh so they made a pretty big splash, like immediately, like pretty early on in the transfer window compared to some, what some other teams have or not done, I guess, for lack of saying. Um, their biggest loss is they lost Walcott and Pennington. But I don't know, if, like, yes, they brought in squad members, but I don't feel like they strengthened in any sense. You know what I mean? Like, they brought in people, but I don't think they upgraded by any means. they filled gaps. Yeah, they, they, not, they plugged in some players, but they didn't – the quality is just like – DeMar Gray said he'd be the next Jaden Sancho over there, and he didn't perform for Levin Hughes yeah. like at all. Yeah. So I, I, I don't see what they're – like I get like you have to fill the squad, but I just don't – they went from whatever – where did they finish last year? Eighth? Seventh? I mean, it was a top ninth. ten finish. Yeah, I think they were just in the top ten. Um, Everton was ten. They were t- – okay, so they dropped down that far even. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, their biggest needs, especially if, if that happens, I know James and Rafa Benitez don't get along too well from their time at Real together. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. more than likely, they're going to need attacking midfielders, um, shore up the defense, center back, right back kind of kind of situation, and then go from there. But striker, they have uh, Calvert Louis, Moise Keane. Did he just come back from loan? So I think they're trying to PSG, they trying to purchase they're, him. They're trying to purchase him. Okay, th- that's like up in the air right now. But currently, he's still an Everton player. Okay, so I mean, if he comes back, that's fine up top. But if not, they're definitely gonna have to fill in a void there, uh, just to create mm-hmm. some competition and stuff. But other than that, yeah. attacking mid, just in the middle of the park, because um, if Thomas does leave, you saw how much of an impact he did make, especially in the beginning yeah. of the year last year when they went on a absolute roll. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's pretty much their biggest needs. They're gonna have an interesting transfer window. I think they need to upgrade seriously uh, in the terms of quality, but they aren't they aren't gonna go anywhere. They're not in any relegation threats by any means, but they definitely have a. Yeah. They'll have a tough time making top of the table. I think they're a good challenger to Tottenham's European UCL inaugural championship hopes. <laughs> Once we win that conference this year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, think, you actually think they're going to win a trophy. That's funny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think they made a really good move picking up Towson too. I mean, they started all, well, they were top of the table for how long? Uh, it was first almost a month. First six yeah, games, two. roughly. It wasn't until Richarlison was out injured that they started just dropping points, dropping points. So I think bringing in that another attacking midfielder or you know, winger, whatever you want to call him, because he kind of drifts everywhere. And mm-hmm. as long as he keeps scoring goals like he did against uh, Manchester City a couple of years ago, what well, question is are they able to keep him? But that's you know, like yeah. there's, there's rumors flying around about him too. Yeah, about Real. Elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, we'll see where that one goes for them. But they definitely have to improve a little bit, without a doubt. Um, next up, we got Mike, his favorite Mega United Leeds fan over here. 
Yeah. yeah. When I'm not supporting Spurs and ripping my hair out, I am loving me some Marcelo Biza and Leeds. Um, awesome team to watch. Super fun, super exciting. Obviously, their biggest uh, area of improvement, and it's not even like they have really bad defenders, but because they're so attack focused and so on the foot, they tend to get caught out a whole hell of a lot. So they really need to make sure they're doing something to shore up that defense, whether it's a defensive midfielder. Or actually, they already have Calvin Phillips, who proved himself in the Euros to be phenomenal. But some, maybe someone to partner along with him, you know, who really can sit anchor there, help protect the back line. If not, have a new center back. They just signed Junior Firpo from Barcelona. He's going to be really fun to watch in that team. Probably good bombing down the left flank. Flank. Um, they probably really just need a, a center back um, and maybe like a couple squad players to help fill in gaps for people who get tired under that entire rigorous, um, you know, tactical mm-hmm. style of play they have. So we'll see. You know, it's funny, actually, going back to the Arsenal conversation, David Luiz, in my opinion, is the perfect center back for them, pinging long balls forward. I, th- I think so. The way they play fast in transition – David Luiz is a long ball player. I mean, I'm not saying he's going to go there, obviously. I'm not saying it's the number one target they should be looking at. I'm just saying, to your point, Mike, with the central defender, someone that's going to move the ball really quickly in transition for them so that they can just keep their lightning pace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see who they go after for that center back spot. But that's probably what they need, realistically. I like your idea there, Vito. I don't know how, like, I don't know the execution on how that would work out, though. (laughs) Yeah, no, no. No, I'm not saying he wouldn't kick it out of bounds. I'm just saying. <laughs> just they saying. might give up a few yeah, more yeah. goals even after that, but that's besides the fact. Yeah, no, they're they're a pretty solid team. Um, I know we we always talk about like a sophomore slump over in the Premier League and stuff like that, but I really don't see them in any situation to where they should fall to that mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. any means. I think they're a pretty solid squad all around. They just uh, made Jack Harrison a p- uh, permanent signing as well. Awesome. Yeah, Furpo. I. They signed a Chelsea Academy at a guy, Louis Bate. He, he's over there now, like an attacking midfielder, probably get a little bit of time. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, no, they, they're a pretty solid team inside and out. I don't see them. Defender, yeah. maybe attacking mid. And then after that, they really don't need much, I don't think. Mm-hmm. Uh, last but not least for today, we have Leicester City, Vito. Poor Leicester City. <laughs> One point. Back to back epic bottles. Oh, <laughs> my God. Can we just officially call them the new bottlers? Can we just get that title off? Of no, top? I, I think it's no, no, no it's shame, it's like a bottler. It's, it's like dominoes now, more like it. But, <laughs> but um, it's this is weird to say, but um, I, I think they do need to look for a striker. Ian Acho had did have a good season last year. He he did very well to fill in for a, a floundering Jamie Vardy, who we typically don't see, but. I think starting to look for a long-term replacement for Vardy mm-hmm. is kind of a top priority for them. Um, and I, I think they need really need to be looking at the, the center back position. Um, so Yanchu was injured last year. Um, and Evans um, too. Who was? Evans, yeah. Yeah, and, and the moment they got injured, that was when everything kind of started to slide for them towards the back half of the season. Mm-hmm. Um, Fofana was good flow, for them. What's too. up? Fofana, Wesley Fofana, who they signed. He was, he was awesome. Yeah. He, was, yeah, he was an great. awesome center. He was great fantastic. Feeling. Yeah. But um, a Pereira, on, a Pereira was out on the right flank as well. So yep. it's the I think the defense and the striker all around um, defense, I should say, is kind of where they need to be looking, um, either from a depth perception, depth perspective, or from an overall quality pr- um, perspective. Who knows when Pereira comes back if he's going to be the same Pereira who who tore it up, you know, two years ago? And there's just a lot of speculation on Sanchu and, and potentially him leaving um, as well. So I think I think a long term replacement for Vardy maybe. And in particular, I think what Leicester really need is someone who's won something, someone who can come into that team and stop the slide that we've seen that happened to them in the last two years in the back half of the season. While you have a leader like Jamie Vardy on that team, you need someone who's been there to to kind of clot the blood flow, you know? Well, they, they have. They, they won the FA Cup. Yeah, but they, yeah, they won it this year, though, after the slide was already too late to stop, basically. Yeah. They put all their eggs in that basket, but they were trying, yeah. trying to hold on to the Champions League. Yeah. 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 No doubt. They actually, so I don't know if you saw Vito or not. They actually did sign uh, Pats and Daka yeah, he's uh, supposed, from, from yeah. Salzburg. He actually has a pretty good goal scoring record. It's basically 0. 0.5. I didn't um, see that. So, I didn't see that yet. He's supposed yeah. to be pretty damn good from what yeah, I Yeah. So he scored 68 in 125 appearances for him. So, I mean, nothing like a cra- like crazy number, but yeah, it's yeah. still pretty, that's still pretty see good. Yeah. Transfers man. in the Premier League. Hopefully for them, it stays around mm-hmm. those numbers. Yeah. And then regardless, 
you, like you said, they're going to have to find a replacement for Vardy. He's not going to be around forever. I think, what is he, 34 now? Yeah, he's up there. there. Yeah. He's, he's up there. So he, he's, he's going to be leaving very shortly anyway. So between Ian Nacho, this guy, and then if they bring in anyone else potentially for the next year, just to kind of get that more, a little bit more competition. I thought the Ryan Bertrand signing was very good for them because uh, mm-hmm. they lost uh, uh, Chilwell plus – Yeah. Uh, what's his face? The guy that used to have the Austrian guy, uh, Fuchs. Fuchs, you know, yeah. Fuchs. So just a little bit of experience there. Yeah. West Morgan retired, so definitely center backs a big a big need for them. Um, just for like you said, depth. Uh, because yeah. the injuries come around, rolling around. That's that's what got them pretty much. So, yeah. we'll Other than that, I think they're having a pretty Madison. good. I mean, they're gonna be fun to watch though, regardless. Like they have that Barnes kid who's really good. He's Harry Barnes. That, yeah, that kid. That kid's like underratedly good. They got Daka yeah. coming in. Madison. They still got Vardy up top for experience. Ian Nacho. Um, I don't think they have Senzuger still, Senzuger still, but um, I'm trying to think who they have to play on the right. Is it Iozzi Perez typically too, or someone like that? Yeah. Perez right on the right Perez. side. Yeah. Yeah. He kind of drifts in behind the striker a bit. Yeah. It's they're They're going to have a fun team to watch. And so yeah. I, it just really comes down to them staying healthy. Realistic. Yeah. yeah no doubt. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that um, pretty much wraps it up for this episode, guys. I mean, it's our very first one and everything. Do you guys have anything else you want to add to, uh, to the end here? Yeah, I would say in, in terms of what we discussed and every team's need and, you know, a little bit of transfer speculation and who they can bring in, I, I'm curious what the first big domino is going to be because there, there's always one. There's always one that sets off a chain reaction and and then you know exactly, like, okay, maybe Madison goes to Arsenal, Arsenal, you know, do this and mm-hmm. this back and forth. And I'm curious who that first domino is going to be because you know it's coming. Yeah, top six teams really haven't been doing much at all for the most part. Uh, lesser, I, I, I guess you can almost consider them one now. Or, um, they probably made the biggest splash, and they really wasn't even major. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So okay, yeah. that pretty much wraps up our first episode, guys, of the Sunday League Screamers podcast. If you want to follow us on Twitter, SL Screamers, we uh, pretty much where we're probably going to be most active. I don't think we have anything else set up right now. So that and YouTube. Uh, listen we're to us on, on iTunes, Spotify, on Twitch, guys. We yeah. are working on yeah, Twitch. If Twitch you want to play, team. if you want to play in our pro clubs team on FIFA, yeah. we are working on that one. So we're gonna get that set up very shortly for you. So yep. I'll that's gonna do it for Michael today. Raging. It'll be great. <laughs> yeah, you can watch video hit the crossbar sixteen times, and you're gonna get a good <laughs> laugh out of it. Why are you jinxing me right now? No, I'm not. It, it's, it's, that's just absurdity. that's just fact. That's going to happen. Yeah. But, but um, yeah, it does it for us this on this episode, guys. Follow us on uh, Twitter, uh, subscribe to us on YouTube, and wherever else you can hear this podcast. So, peace out. Later. Thanks, everyone.